For our next presentation, Pat will be speaking about thinking about binary compatibility and CentOS Stream. Thank you all so much for attending. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A tab. And uh, as, a, as a special bonus, the slides for this presentation are already on the wiki if you want to follow along on your end. So thank you, Pat. Thanks, Rich. So a couple of quick things before we get started. I'm not an official spokesperson for Fermi Research Alliance, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, or the US Department of Energy. None of the above make any uh, assertions of warranty, liability. This is not an endorsement of any technology, software, service, or organization. Uh, this is a presentation of research as I work at a research laboratory. So in this presentation, there's basically going to be a path ahead of us here. There's really nothing more boring than when I sit here and I read the slides to you, except when you probably know what's on all of them. But I couldn't think of a better way to ensure a uniform understanding of the topic ahead, simplify translation for non-English speakers, since this is a globally available conference, and provide a slide deck that you can use when you're under time pressure. Uh, for the ops people, this presentation should help you put the dev in DevOps. And for the dev people, this should help you put the ops in DevOps. As an aside, I've never worked at a place where folks complained about just how thorough the communication is between dev and ops. Good communication is hard, just like good coordination. So will my RHEL application run on CentOS Stream? In practice, this is a function of the RHEL ABI and API guarantees. I've got a link here that you will see several times. Uh, when using items that are on the RHEL approved list, if it runs on RHEL, it should run on CentOS Stream without any modifications. Any incompatibilities there are bugs that need to be addressed. The stable ABI and API is really about consistency and dependability. I don't like how the word stable is overloaded here. And so I want you to think about consistency and dependability when you think about the stable ABI. Uh, please note, this is a presentation about user space. The kernel is a whole separate animal. It's got a separate documentation for its guarantees. A wonderful presentation yesterday I would encourage you to review. There's also a, log, uh, a blog post talking about how these interfaces change and how they work through them. Let's take a look at this API guarantee list. There's four levels. Uh, level one is dependable within the lifetime of the major release and the next two major releases. This is things like glibc and libxml2. Then there's level two. These things are scoped within the lifetime of a single major release and consistent within it. This is the default. If a package doesn't say it's something else, it's level two. Then with oh, RHEL 8, we get level 3 capabilities, which are items that are guaranteed during their lifetime. Uh, so this is stuff like AppStream and modularity that don't run the full 10-year life cycle of RHEL, but run it for a subset. Uh, those items can uh, are explicitly listed out in the AppStream modularity documentation. And lastly, we get to level 4 items, where they guarantee there are no guarantees. Um, these are summaries. If you care about the specifics, I would encourage you to read the official documentation, which is the item that Red Hat's actually bound to. So will my CentOS Stream application run on RHEL? This is probably the question you're more interested in. And this is still a function of that ABI API consistency guarantee. The implementation is going to be a bit different, though. So in order to answer this, we need to look at how binaries actually run on a Linux system and what that means within a RHEL context. For right now, we can treat an ELF binary as a kind of runtime package. This should help us stay focused. After all, a binary RPM generally contains a collection of ELF binaries. We're going to ignore other types of binaries and ELF behavior on non-Linux platforms. Today, we care about ELF on Linux. And the bits that we care about specifically are really the binary payload and the library linkage and symbols. Uh, the binary payload is just the instructions that we're going to execute. If the CPU doesn't have the instructions, the binary is going to segfault when it hits an unknown instruction. RPM is really not looking for this type of thing, and that's probably for the best. The overhead on that is going to be pretty heavy. So microarchitectures like x86, 64, v2 are really interesting, but those are going to be out of scope for what we're talking about. For our purposes today, x86, 64 in the package arch is good enough to say it runs on this machine. Library linkages and symbol exports are more complicated and are honestly what we're going to talk about for the rest of this presentation. There's a number of ways we can look at the dynamic libraries that a binary uses and what symbols they provide. LDD is the common go-to. OBJ dump is what most of the system tools use. And I like read elf. Note, LDD will actually execute elements of the object to not just look at the symbol linkage, but actually execute it to see if the symbols link, which can actually have some really interesting unsafe behavior. 
Uh, the man page in LDD describes how this can be ex exploited. It's totally interesting. It's worth a read. You can also use AVI package diff from libabigail to look at changes between uh, binary objects. We're gonna look specifically at the LZ package today. It's a compatibility level two package, which is the default for uh, packages in RHEL, as this is a direct quote from their documentation. AVIs and APIs are stable within the lifetime of a single major release. Compatibility level two application interfaces will not change from minor release to minor release and can be relied upon by the application to be stable for the duration of the major release. So let's actually open it up and take a look. RPM uses OBJ dump to actually review the linkage of individual binaries. Uh, this is actually the command OBJ, oh, OBJ dump dash P is what it runs. And I've got a snippet of the output here for a reference where you can see what symbols it's using, where they're linked, and how. Uh, this presentation is going to switch back and forth between OBJ dump and readelf. I like readelf for the details that it provides me. Most of the system tools use OBJ dump. To be honest, if you're looking at these kinds of things, you should find a tool that you like and learn its, under, learn its limitations and its risks and get comfortable using it. With readelf, we can see exactly which foreign functions are available and the specific information about them. So in the context of XZ here, we can see specifically these libs, oh, LZMA stream encoder flags as well as some other ones and the namespaces that are attached to them. In this instance, we have XZ 5.2 and XZ 5.0. So what we put together with all this is the XC binary on my test EL8 system uses libLZMA SO5 to resolve its symbols. Some of these symbols are XC50 and some of them are 52. In particular, libs oh, LZMA stream encoder XC50 and LZMA stream encoder MT5.2. Conveniently, libLZMA follows the standard convention where the dot five and SO.5 corresponds to library version five. And any, any system that provides these APIs can run this binary. As a reminder, libLZMA is a level two compatibility object. So let's look at what level two compatibility actually means in practice. If I take the XZ binary from EL7 and I put it on an EL8 host and I try and run it, the error that I get is listed there where it can't find a specific uh, namespace, in particular XZ512 alpha. And if you take it apart with readelf, you can see that it's looking for LZMA stream encoder MT. Similarly, if I take the XC binary from an EL8 box and I try and run it on an EL7 host, it complains about two issues, uh, missing glibc232 and XC5.2. And if we look at the XC symbols, again, we see specifically it's looking for LZMA stream encoder MT. If you note, those are the same symbol, but there's really nothing unexpected here. Between major releases, the LZMA symbols get to change. That's what level two compatibility is about. And the addition of new symbols to glibc in EL8 is something we expect, and it's a good thing. These are new features that the system has acquired. So if we take a little look into what level one compatibility is doing for us with glibc, and in particular libp thread, because that's where the uh, behavior seems to actually manifest. If we open up the item, we see pthread sigmask from glibc 232 is what's used in EL8, and pthread sigmask from glibc 225 is what's used in EL7. So if we hop over to the glibc change log for libpthread, we see that libpthread adder sigmask np and pthread uh, adder getmask np were added. They, uh, were, uh, they allow you to create uh, signal masks for threads with pthread create, which unsurprisingly then translates to a new symbol in the glibc232 namespace for pthread sigmask. But if you open up uh, glibc on EL8, you'll see the old symbol is still there. So our level one rules are satisfied. We were able to take that EL7 binary and run it on the EL8 system, and it complained about libLZMA and not glibc. So what does this mean in practice? Well, the solution to this one is pretty trivial. If you open up the libLZMA change log, the symbol was actually introduced in LXC512 alpha. It was stabilized in XC5.2 and saw no changes in the return arguments or uh, the arguments or the return structure. So in the end, the API of a binary is basically the arguments, the return structure, the symbol name, and the namespace. In this instance, three of these are the same. The namespace is really what's different. So you could just take the code, recompile it, and relink it, and it will work exactly as before. But we're not talking about porting software right now. We're talking about ABI consistency. So to keep matters simple, let's stick with libLZMA and look at EL7, where we actually have a bunch of history we can examine to see what the future likely holds. In 2016, 
Uh, lib LZMA was rebased from 512 alpha oh, to 12 alpha to 522. The upstream source code has the symbols in question tagged as XC5.2. But the EL7 source it has to patch this code to keep these symbols, in particular LZMA stream encoder MT and LZMA stream encoder MTM usage, marked as 512 alpha and in that namespace. The rebase also adds some new symbols, which get tagged in as the 522 namespace, which matches the version of libLZMA where they were introduced in EL7. But the actual patch that's doing this is here. I believe it was written by Pavel. The changelog is a little unclear on this front. But this is the patch that is actually doing the work. It is very rare that I can find a patch that I gush over not just the actual well, like programmatic changes, but also the changelog for being detailed, clear, and on point. I'd encourage you to read this patch, understand this patch and what it's doing. In short, oh, the changelog is really clear. Uh, from the changelog itself, we provide uh, two uh, 512 alpha symbols in LZMA stream encoder MT and LZMA stream encoder MTM usage before we update to 522. The symbols didn't change ABI, so they should be safe to provide. For better reasoning, look in container H and 512 alpha for the symbols and their testing purposes. So if we open those up, and we look at container H in the release he mentions, we see, yes, those symbols are marked as part of their unstable namespace. Well, what does that mean? For libLZMA upstream, these symbols are part of the 5.2 namespace. They were in the unstable namespace for 5.1.2 alpha and not part of the ABI. They were there to be all evaluated and used by the communities to see what they were worth. For EL7, they have to stay in the 5.1.2 alpha namespace or level two compatibility is broken. This slide, and in particular, this patch, are honestly the centerpiece of this presentation. They are critical for understanding what's going on here. And to my mind, they're extremely sort of high level management safe for explanation purposes. Uh, here is exactly what's happening, exact explanations as to why it's happening, and the code that's making it happen. So you can see not just the theory, but the practice all in one simple blob. And if we look at what this does once it's applied, the results are exactly what we would expect. If we take a look at an older version, uh, for example, 5.1.2.8 alpha, and see what its dependencies are, you'll see it lists that it requires the 5.1.2 alpha namespace. And if we look at the new version that has 5.2.2 and this patch applied, it requires the 5.1.2 alpha namespace and the 5.2.2 namespace. The new RPM correctly determined what new symbols were needed without an explicit version check under the RPM build requirements. RPM saw that the XC binary needed these objects from the namespace, picked them up automatically, and set the correct dependencies. There's no need for explicit dependencies. RPM is doing the right thing, and it's all a result of that simple patch. That's the wrong direction. So what have we seen here? We've seen that when the source gets rebased the symbols uh, and symbols get added, the maintainer was required to honor the previous symbol names and namespaces and to patch the old ones back in. We've seen RPM correctly identify the new symbols and not require any additional maintenance. We've also seen that new binaries get symbol name, or get the stable symbol names when built against them. We've seen the level two libraries can break between major releases. And we've seen that in practice right here, right now, the ABI API guarantees worked exactly the way they were supposed to. There's no surprises, no excitement, and you probably never noticed this happened on any of your EL7 boxes. But what does that actually mean for CentOS Stream? Well, I think of CentOS Stream as the continuous delivery repository for RHEL. RHEL updates are published in bundles or batches or point releases, but they're on scheduled intervals. Stream is published now. The packages in CentOS Stream are headed into RHEL. To my mind, that means they must be suitable for running on RHEL. Packages in CentOS Stream that violate the RHEL ABI API guarantees are not suitable for running on RHEL. Therefore, breakage of the RHEL ABI API guarantees shouldn't happen in Stream. If a CentOS Stream package violates the RHEL ABI and API guarantees, the maintainer has to fix it. This isn't optional. This isn't something that you can consider as an afterthought. If it doesn't get fixed, it's going to change in RHEL. If it changes in RHEL, it violates the contracts that are part of what you're paying for with a subscription. That's very bad. So packages that break on the RHEL ABI API guarantees in CentOS Stream are serious bugs. If you manage to encounter one of those, file it, and it has to get fixed. And it shouldn't happen because it shouldn't be getting that far to begin with. 
The maintenance of existing symbols is really something that we understand at this point. New symbols is really where this gets complicated. New symbols are not on the rel list, so they're not guaranteed. But this doesn't mean that they're just going to randomly change before they go into rel, just that they can change. But how can they change? If we actually look at what's possible, we can change the arguments or the return type, but those don't feel like things that you would take from upstream and just change them. Those are things that upstream picked and decided upon. Similarly, the symbols have names, and I suppose you could change those names, but again, that's stuff that upstream picked and decided upon, so why would you rename it? The namespace really seems to be our only option for things that can change here between when it goes into stream and when it lands in rel. So the use of new symbols presents a risk, but there's really several mitigation strategies. For developers, these boil down to know what you're using, and for operations, it's really a question of how do you provide these in a clear manner? So developers, what should we be thinking about? Now, step one is always know what you're using. This is already true for RHEL 8 with AppStream and modularity. If your application links against MariaDB or against Postgres, you have to keep track of which version of MariaDB, which version of Postgres you're using. Similarly, if you're using GCC or LLVM or Python or Perl or Rust or Swig, or any of the things that are in AppStream or modularity, you have to already track the versions that you're compatible with. So this isn't a new problem, it's just a specific instance. So the big questions that we're left with are, the new library features you selected new? Are, are they not yet in RHEL? If they're not yet in RHEL, do you need them? The answer can be yes, but know why you need them. Because it's new doesn't automatically mean it's better. It doesn't automatically mean that it's going to help you. It just means that it's different. So consider using ABI package diff from libabigail to track your package ABI changes over time. When you've got the debug info installed, it's way, way more detailed than this. But even at this simple example here, where I compare the 512 alpha libLZMA to the 522 libLZMA, we see specifically here which functions changed, which variables changed, summaries of those changes, and we get the specific names of symbols that were added in the 522 package that were not present in the 512 namespace in a clear, digestible format. Uh, additionally, libAppigail provides the ABI compat command, which you can use to further review a library's dependencies. Reports from this can be amazingly helpful for determining compatibility and tracking changes over time. Run this not just on the packages that you build, but the packages you depend on to see how they're changing understand why they're changing, and record this information for your own support purposes later on. These reports are detailed references that amount to a couple of kilobytes of text. So how do you tell if a feature is new? Well, look at the documentation for your library. Is the feature you're using listed as coming from a newer version than the one you've got installed? If so, it was backported to the EL source. But when? Just because it was backported doesn't mean it was backported recently. So, okay, was the library rebased recently in stream? Well, what does recently mean in this context? The easy way is just test your binary with the rel UBI image. The rel universal base image, and I have a link to an ebook here, is real rel. The UBI is free to download and redistribute. As a direct quotation from this ebook, no subscription, login, or even registration is required for the UBI images. So, build your application, fire it up in the UBI container. If it doesn't run in the UBI container, you're not on the rel ABI and API. And this comes down to, well, if you picked something that hasn't made it in rel, know why you picked it and know how to explain and defend that as part of your development practices. Additionally, if you're packaging things for RPM, let RPM do the heavy lifting. If we look at our XZRPM again, the one that was rebuilt for 5.2.2, We'll see there's no explicit mention of a specific version of libLZMA that is required. RPM knows what you need. It runs OBJ dump to see which, oh, which namespaces you require and then puts those into your requirement headers. So if I had hard coded into the spec file that this also needs libLZMA version 5.2.2, that's something that I'm going to have to maintain and change. Because the thing is, I don't need libLZMA 5.2.2. I need the symbols that libLZMA 5.2.2 provides. And if a newer version of that library still provides those old symbols, that library works just fine for me. And all I've done is created a maintenance headache and an unnecessary point of complexity. 
So let RPM do the checks for your binary linkages. That's something it does very well. Let's rely on that and lean into this idea that we say people want RHEL because of the stable API. Well, then let's lean into the stable API. But there's also surprise symbols. If we look back at our EL8 XZ binary and the pthread SIGMAS symbol selection, LibLZMA didn't say, oh, I want this newest, latest, and greatest version. It just used the pthread headers, headers that are on the system. So how do you force a specific version when there's multiple versions out there? Well, GCC has already got you covered on this. There's a thing you can throw into your source code. Here, for example, ASM simver pthread SIGMASK pthread SIGMASK equals glibc2225. And that will pick the specific version and override the linker or the compiler's behavior and tell you, this is the version of this symbol that I want. Uh, there's actually a blog post that goes into much more detail on how this works and why this functions. But you can build into your comp compilation options ways of increasing your compatibility if you know there's multiple symbols out there by a given name and you want something specific. glibc itself is probably the most likely source of surprise symbols. And since we're looking at EL7, we can gather some useful stats from it. After all, it's in year seven of support now, security errata only mode. New features in EL7 are kind of a surprise at this point. So popping open uh, glibc so 6 from glibc 217.323, we see it contains 2,125 symbols, which are scoped to multiple namespaces. Some of them are unscoped versions of the scoped symbol. If we take the original glibc that was published with EL7, which in this instance is 2.17.55, it contains 2,100 symbols. Now, initially, you're like, well, that's 25 symbols. That's a little sketchy. The test methodology I left here on the bottom is to use read elf to rip these things apart and then kind of manually compare them. If you use ABI diff here, which you should use to do this, you will see that I would argue there's actually no difference between the two ABIs. There appear to be 25 symbol differences. However, that no default suppression there should give you a hint as to why despite the fact there are 25 symbol differences, I'd say there is no actual difference. And I'm gonna kind of leave running this one to you so you can run this, see the output, and see why they're di and why they appear to be different, but actually aren't. So this should give you a place where you can look at, okay, so in seven years, the symbols didn't change in glibc. That's exciting. That gives us the kind of long-term compatibility we've been looking for Developers, there's some things you can't do when you run into a weird position. You can't really extract specific symbols from a binary library. A binary library is a blob of instructions, not a file system directory of symbols or a tar archive. Every single time I run into this problem, that's what I think I should do here. I'll just pop this thing open and deal with it. The binary has been optimized. The related jumps are relative to the location within the blob. If you disassemble it, you can possibly reassemble some sort of stub library with a subset. But if you've gotten this far down the chain, a better question is, is this feature worth it? Or can I just ship the new library? Since the new feature you're shipping, oh, since you need a new feature, shipping the whole library makes a lot more sense. Upstream probably tested it that way. If you want to build a new binary that just contains the symbols you want, you can always edit the source and compile what you desire. And honestly, that's going to be a lot less work than using a disassembler on an existing binary. There's also some dangerous things you can do. Elf objects support an RPath value you can use to tweak the symbol resolution. If you need this, you should read up on DT RPath versus DT RunPath. In RHEL, RPM won't let you package binaries with encoded RPath values. This is a good thing. Packages should either ship with the libraries they need and put them in a rational place, or depend on the libraries already in a rational place. If you're using RPath, you're claiming you know better than the system linker. Is that actually true? For instance, the SPAC package manager actually does this with RPath because it knows where its dependent libraries go. Uh, you can use the patch elf tool to actually mess around with RPath on existing binaries. But don't do this on a file that's owned by a package manager. Updates to the package will lose the changes, the installation is no longer repeatable by the package manager, and it just makes a mess. So operations folks, what should we do? We should use technologies that are linkage aware like package managers, not make install. RPM uses objdump to evaluate what you need. It's tracking this at the namespace version level, not at the individual binary symbol. A badly behaving library can add symbols to an existing namespace and an older or existing copy might have that namespace 
but not the new symbols. Adding a feature and not changing the version is a really bad practice. When this happens, file bugs on it. Honestly, the fastest way to diagnose this is probably with LDD. But Pat, LDD is dangerous. Yes, it is. But you're trying to figure out why a specific binary doesn't link on a specific system. And to do that, you have to actually execute the linker. So LDD-R will tell you what you're looking for. But don't run that as a root on a binary that you don't trust. It's not a good idea. But in this instance, you can see it spits out exactly which symbols my EL7 binary is looking for on my EL8 box. And with some various searches or looking at the namespacing, you can kind of tell what's missing right away. The namespaces are well defined. And it's like, hmm, I'm missing the oh, XE5.2.2 .2 namespace. I wonder where that comes from. There's plenty of workarounds, but if you find yourself needing these workarounds, you've hit a bug. And that bug should be filed with the package owner or the person who gave you the binaries. For applications as a non root but non daemon user, Use local lib directory as a place users can drop their own libraries and just add it to LD library path. Also, you can use all local.bin as a place to put things, along with looking into the XDG base directory specification. Uh, for daemons running out of systemd, you can just add another directory to the service, uh, services defined LD library path with a systemd drop in. If the application doesn't fit under these and not within a container, I'd really look at generating a flat pack to ensure that the extra libraries are walled off from the rest of the system, and it can be trivially moved to a new box down the line. In my experience, a one-time install is never a one-time install, so I'm going to ask you to do it again at some point, and having something that you can pick up and move is just easier. It's tempting to just drop a config file in etsy ld so -conf .d, but this is going to pollute the global linker space, and that's not necessarily what you want. It's tempting to just use our path to fix it, but this is invisible, and you will forget that it was done. So what have we learned, and how can we apply it? Well, the existing self-tests are pretty good. But with your help, they can be great. Take a look at the check section in your favorite package. Ask about next steps in CentOS DEVEL. Functional testing workloads are also welcome. This is how we assure the quality of the released packages. A Koji plugin to run ABI diff against the artifacts from the last build would produce an amazing record of changes. We could actually have an automated way of listing out what all ABI differences there are between things that is a part of our build system. That link right there is a link to a bug report requesting someone do that. There's also the possibility of some new output formats for libabigail. Could it perhaps produce annotated sources from the debug info in the debug source to describe the differences between the two elements? or possibly JSON that we could digest into some kind of automated reporting tool? Is there some other kind of output format that might be useful? Some way to make this data more digestible and more visible would be an amazing area where we could really assure people these binaries look and behave in compatible ways. Which just brings us back to the basic question. So will my CentOS stream application run on RHEL? You've been sitting here for about half an hour, and that's all the answer you really want. And I think that the answer is, well, that kind of depends on how you're using the ABI and the mindset of your developers. Something built on CentOS Stream should run on RHEL if it was built with compatibility in mind. If the binary's got some special requirements, there's ways we can work around those until the symbols are stabilized and become part of the guarantee. So yeah, it shouldn't be a problem to run your CentOS binary or your CentOS Stream binary on RHEL. It should just work with perhaps the minimal amount of coaxing. So as we reach the end of my presentation, I just need to provide this was all supported by Fermi Research Alliance and all of the items there. And so with all of that, I can actually take some questions. So I see from the chat, uh, we've got a uh, UBI is a subset of packages. Uh, yes. U UBI is a subset of packages. Uh, you don't have the DVL stuff in there. In my experiments and playing around with things, I haven't found a, a thing that I need that was not in UBI. So all of the libraries I was looking for were there. I, I spend a lot of my time in interpreted languages. So it's difficult to uh, really reach down and say, yeah, I've checked. I spend most of my time in Python. I love the Python. And so I haven't checked all of them, but 
everything I have looked for in UBI, I have found. And I suspect if you find something in that you're looking for in there that's not a DVL package, because again, UBI is targeted at production or running loads. So if it's not a DVL package and you need it in there, let's reach out to the RHEL product people and ask them for it. Because I'd love to leverage UBI in exactly the way I've described here. Uh, I can set up hundreds and hundreds of CentOS stream boxes and build stuff and then deploy them. And if, as the sort of Red Hat Partner Program has been alleging that stream is the place where you need to uh, you know, test this for the next release, well, then I should be able to run the next release there. Yeah, uh, Carl's mentioned there, if you find that something missing, file a distribution uh, bug in the bug tracker. It'll be the place to go to about that. And if you want to put me on the CC list, I'm always curious. I find most things surprisingly fascinating. Um, so uh, Niels asked about OpenSSL. Yes, OpenSSL does get rebased all the time. But if you look at the ABI for it, uh, the symbols are actually stabilized. And so while it gets rebased, they're adding new symbols. The old symbols are all still there. And the majority of the OpenSSL actual like foreign functions, which is what I try to call them so I remember that they're executable binary codes. The specific foreign functions of any given uh, thing generally take flags that allow you to do different things. Uh, so for example, the one that starts up TLS connections actually takes different flags for the versions of TLS and the ciphers to be supported. And so while OpenSSL is getting rebased, the start TLS function isn't actually changing out from underneath you. It's just gaining new features inside of the function itself. And so that should function uh, along those lines. Additionally, along with the TLS stuff, the OpenSSL library does, uh, does export symbols that are named appropriately. And so you've got a OpenSSL TLS 1.3 function namespace. So when you're actually linking to the TLS 1.3 cipher suite, you actually link against a TLS 1.3 named symbol and RPM magically knows what to do through the power of OBJ dump. So that's something I've seen a few times in the rebuild space. So yeah, I, I apologize for rushing through it, but I wanted to make sure that there was time to get clarification on things because this is such a heavy detail uh, topic. As Rich mentioned, the slides are up and available. I have tried to put links to all of my research in all of the pages. So if you'd like to find out more about any given thing, the slide should generally have a link to what you're looking for. And I'm open to other questions on this front. Last call for questions. All right, well, thank you so much, Pat, for this presentation, and thank you for everyone that attended. And we will have a short break now between this session and the next. So do drop by the, uh, the hallway track, and I imagine Pat will be there to answer questions as you think of them. Thank you all so much. Take care.